right, so let's push start here and we'll get some folks hopping on here. Let me share a prayer with you real quick. I shared it this morning, and it's just so powerful how uh, this pastor from 1760, he came to America from Switzerland. And he was the first minister in the Presbyterian Church in Savannah. And uh, he had a sermon entitled, The Law of Liberty. And you know, and you guys know, because you're here at Patriot Church, but they don't know out there, that all the, all the truth, all the concepts in the Declaration of Independence, in the Constitution, all those biblical concepts that are really in there were preached in pulpits 1600s on up, ushering in the um, Great Awakening, right? And then, of course, bringing us right in to the Revolutionary War. Because why? That They knew, right? The Founding Fathers knew that our God-given rights gave them, empowered them to sign, right, their death warrants to declare their independence from Great Britain and declare, and in that, we always say this because it's so true, when they declared their independence from Great Britain, they declared their dependence upon Almighty God. That's why they did what they did. And aren't you glad they did? All right. So, uh, let me share. And so this is like a 16-page sermon. Peter likes it. He says, I don't have a big enough, a long enough uh, sermon note. So I'm, tonight's four pages, but we'll, we'll get through those. You don't have to be home to what, midnight? I think Shelly said she's, she's good till midnight. So, yeah, we'll be done. So, but this is what he said at the very end of the sermon. He said this. Above all, he said, let everyone earnestly pray that he, Almighty God, right, is higher than the highest would soon make a righteous end of all their confusion. So think about when, what's happening, 1770s in that time period, right? And think about the confusion that's going on today, right? Lots of confusion, lots of chaos, lots of propaganda going on, right? So this prayer is... A, great for today as well. That he would incline the king. So remember, they're not separated yet, right? He's preaching. We're not separated. But we want to incline the king, or in our case, we want to incline the current person sitting in the White House, right? To hear the cries of his subjects, and that no more innocent blood may be shed in America. Wow. And he said, one more thing. Consider the extreme absurdity of struggling for civil liberty and yet to continue slaves to sin and lust. Whoa. Wow. Powerful. Whoa. Sin and lust. And he said, don't you know that who you yield yourselves to, you are slaves to that one. To God? Yes, I see that hand. Sorry. And nothing I can do. Sorry, I have. No, I, it's not going in the mic. It's just picking up right here. Up Thank right you, though, for checking. IPad. Yeah, so he's got it. So another technical difficulty, but that's okay. Anyway, and he went on to say, Become the willing servants of the Lord Jesus. Hearken to obey the voice of his gospel. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, right? And if the Son makes you free, then, and not till then, he said, you shall be free indeed. Amen? So that's powerful. Amen. I love that. And uh, so we're, again, are so glad to be up here on Matrix Way. Thanks, uh, Mr. Houseman and Alex for letting us use this great building here. And uh, so if you need some aluminum, I can do advertising, can I? I'm wow. Sure it's okay, right? Houseman's Aluminum and Screening, West Melbourne, right? What's the address again? 7724. 7724 Matrix Way. So we've got tons of stuff here. It's a beautiful building. So if, yeah, so that's great. All right, so let's get into our outline. And I got a little bit of a glare for some reason, but that's all right. We're okay. So, um, here we go. Separation of church and state. You guys know, and I'll tell you again, that it's a lie. No such thing as separation of church and state. Just because an overreaching judicial arm of the government decides it is, doesn't make it so. 
it's unconstitutional. We have many, many unconstitutional things going on in our country over the course of these years we've had. But I am so excited, we mentioned this morning, to see how awesome it is that some of our states across our land, they're really invoking their 10th Amendment power, which is a great thing. So whether you are here in Florida, or I think we got Pennsylvania, New York, Texas, everybody watching, um, New Hampshire's here tonight, uh, wherever you are, empower your elected officials. It's supposed to be servants, right? Your elected servants. And empower them and remind them of this truth. So this is powerful. So again, we're going to talk about tonight a little bit this history of the separation of church and state. And that's the title, Separation of Church and State. And we said, really? No, not at all. Here's a great maxim. This is our, uh, our spiritual truth tonight. Check out this. This is a prayer about the region. 1951, Board of Regents for none other than the great state of New York. You know what's going on in New York these days, right? But in 1951, they approved this prayer and authorized it, and it was recited every day at the beginning of the school day. And here's what it said. Almighty God, we acknowledge our dependence upon Thee, and we beg Thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. Amen. That was it. If you were a student back in 1951 or, or there, thereabouts, you had an option to step out of the room. You had an option not to pray. You could just sit there. No big deal. This generic prayer is what began this slippery slope. What did they say? Well, they said it's unconstitutional. April 3rd, 1962, Angle versus Vitali. That's the court case. You can look it up. Five parents of school children, two were Jewish, <clears throat> one was an agnostic, one was Unitarian, and one was an ethical culturalist, which today we probably call a humanist. They sued the head of the school board, uh, Vitali, in New Hyde Park, New York. Their complaint was that the prayer violated the First Amendment. Yeah, that was the complaint. So what happened? Well, there's an earlier precedent that took place, and this is a big deal. Uh, 1947, Everson versus the Board of Education. A reversal occurred in 1947 when the Supreme Court for the first time interpreted the separation phrase as requiring the federal government to remove religious expressions from the public arena, 1947. That is, it interpreted the First Amendment not as a limitation on government interference, but rather as a limitation on religious expressions and principles. That court, unlike the previous ones did not print or reprint Thomas Jefferson's very short letter, but they only cited eight words. So here's a Supreme Court case. They're not looking at the Constitution, are they? They're not looking at the Declaration. They're taking out of context a letter written, we'll talk about it in a minute, by Thomas Jefferson. Eight letters. In that letter, he stated a wall of separation between church and state. In short, that 1947 court case was the first one to divorce Jefferson's metaphor from its context and then apply it in a manner exactly opposite to Jefferson's clearly articulated meaning. Whoa. Powerful. Unbelievable. So it violates... The First Amendment, they said, right? So here's your First Amendment. Congress <coughs> shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or, now here's, get this what it says, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Right. Aren't you prohibiting the free exercise thereof when you tell the children they cannot pray? Yes. Yeah or abridging the freedom of speech, or of the press, or of the right of the people to peaceably assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So again, they said it, it violates the establishment cause. What they're trying to say is that the public school is establishing a religion. 
by letting the kids pray. Now, that you don't get much more generic in prayer than that. Crying out to Almighty God, acknowledging our dependence upon Him, begging His blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our country. Shouldn't we be praying for our parents, our teachers, and our country? Absolutely. So, uh, what happened? Well, by June 25th, 1962, the Supreme Court ruled 6 to 1. Two, two uh, yellow bellies didn't vote at all. So, 6 to 1, only one stood upon the real truth of the Constitution. Very liberal court. Um, yeah, so I might have that. Well, let me look it up here. Well, real quick. Yeah. I have a printer off that court case. Let's see if I have it right here. So, uh, six to one. The only one who dissented was Justice Stewart. Justice Stewart. Now, what's really interesting is why did they decide what they did? So, Justice Stewart was the only one who dissented. Uh, so, let's look a little bit about, about this. So, uh, separation of church and state. We already said it's, it's not. Is it in the Constitution? No. Is it in the First Amendment? No. Is it what the Founding Fathers meant? Absolutely not. I love what David Barton says in his... i got a little book here. Let's see if I have it. I'm going to get uh, a bunch more of these. These are these little things. 20 pages of unbelievable information just in this little book. All about separation of, of church and state. Uh, in it, he says this. A conversation, he said, I once had with a U.S. congressman. He said, who also happened to be a, an accomplished attorney. He said, it illustrates how deeply this non-constitutional phrase has been infused in our constitutional thinking. Amazed, I asked him, he said, you've never read the Constitution for yourself? This congressman, this attorney, you have to go to law school, right, to be an attorney still? He said, he replied, we never were required to read it in law school. That law school should be shut down. Why on God's earth would you send out attorneys into the world and not require them to read the Constitution? Look who they work for. Absolute Look who they heresy. Work. Look who they work for. Yeah. So, let's give credit then where credit is due. So let's talk about this the Thomas Jefferson letter. So, October 7th, 1801, the Danbury Baptist Association, Danbury Connect, who's from Connecticut? I know there's some. I lived there for a while. You lived there for a while. Whoa. Well, we How is it? Here. Was it nice? Cold. Cold. Yeah. It used to be it's gotten nice. worse since we left. Used to be nice, yeah. So October 7th, 1801, the Danbury Baptist Association wrote a letter to President Thomas Jefferson. And quote, they were expressing, I have the whole letter if you want to see it, expressing their concern that protection for religion had been written into the laws and constitution believing strongly that freedom of religion was an inalienable right given by God, the fact that it appeared in civil documents suggested that the government viewed it as a government-granted uh, rather than God-granted right. So that was their concern. So we put it in the Constitution, but look what happened, right? We, we saw go forward 100 years and see that's exactly what the Supreme Court chose to do, twist the truth. So what happens? So Jefferson gets that letter, and in response, January 1st, 1802, mail was slow back then, he responds to him. He says, Believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, I contemplate with sovereign reverence the act of the whole American people which declared that their legislature should Here's the quote. He's quoting from the First Amendment now. Make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Seems really cut and dry. Seems really clear. Then he says, thus, building a wall of separation between the church and the state. In a book I have, 
entitled The Life and Selected Writings of Thomas Jefferson. In that, I have the letter that he wrote back to them uh, in, in its entirety. A uh, powerful letter, not, not real long, but he gets to the point of what he's trying to he's talking about. So, in that, what's he say next? Well, Jefferson's Wall of Separation was to what? Was to secure the church against governmental interference, not remove the church from the government. What was the big deal? They wanted to make sure they were going to avoid another Church of England. That was the big deal, right? That's where our religious expression became infringed upon in England. If you weren't in the Church of England, hey man, there's going to be some tyranny going on, right? That's the big deal. So that was the concern that the Danbury Baptists had and many others did. Uh, so they're giving Thomas Jefferson this credit with writing this into the Constitution, which he never did. Who was the actual, one of the true authors of the, of the First Amendment was a man named Fisher Ames. That's uh, letter B under number three there. Fisher Ames, he's considered one of the true authors of the First Amendment. There was a debate. Do you know, have you ever heard of the congressional record? Anything that is spoken in the halls of Congress is written down and recorded in this congressional record. All right. So no, you can't. I mean, it's, I don't know if they try to try to fix it, try to erase. I don't know what they do, but there's this thing called the congressional record. The First Amendment was debated by the 90 founders in the first federal Congress. From June 8th to September 25th, 1789, they framed the First Amendment. And you can see the congressional record where all the official words and acts that occur in Congress chambers must be recorded. And it's required, of course, by the Constitution, Article 1, if you have your Constitution, Article 1, Section 5, Paragraph 3. So when the First Amendment was finally approved, it contained two separate clauses each with an independent scope of action. The first clause, you've heard this before, the Establishment Clause. Yeah. That prohibits the federal government from establishing a, a what? Yeah. A national de denomination, right? I mean, yeah. hey, we like to have Patriot Church be the, the church of the land, right? But we want others to freely worship, right? Yeah. So if you want to worship the tree, worship the tree. We don't care. Just don't try to make my kids worship the tree, right? Yeah. Okay. So the second clause is called the free exercise clause. You've heard that term before. Yeah. And that prohibits the federal government from interfering with the people's public religious expressions and acknowledgments. Significantly, both clauses restricted the actions of the federal government, neither, as you can read, right, neither restrict the actions of the citizens. That's right. But what happened? You get an overreaching judicial court, and they decide to do what they want to do. And my cry the whole time, and as I keep seeing it happen again and again, where's the checks and balances? Where's the pushback? See, our, our republic was set up so that the other two branches could push back from or to see if they saw a, another branch taking up too much power. If you read Article 1, you'll see exactly what Congress can and cannot do. If you read Article 2, you'll see what the executive branch can and cannot do. And Article 3, which is the smallest of the articles, is what the judicial branch can and cannot do. Anything not clearly stated in the Constitution reverts back to each individual state according to the 10th Amendment. And that's a big deal. So, uh, Fisher Ames was, uh, he was like, uh, I, I would compare him to um, Dr. Um, my Bob? Who's that? Grandpa. Nope, no, no to, back then. Um, I forgot his name. Love Sam God, Adam. love your country, oh. love your family. Benjamin Rush, mm -hmm. yeah. So he also was a watchdog for education for Whoa. kids. He said this, the Bible must continue to be a school book. September 20th, 1789. Look what he wrote. Now, 
this just makes me want to just fall on the ground. This September 20th, 1789, get the year, not very far after we signed the, the Declaration, right? Yeah. Look what he says. We have, back then, we have a dangerous trend. He said, this is the warning in 1789. We have a dangerous trend beginning to take place in our education. D did you get that? Yeah. We're starting to put more and more textbooks into our schools. <laughs> you been to a school board meeting lately? Whoa. They're trying to put all kinds of things beyond textbooks now in your schools. We've become accustomed of late of putting little books into the hands of our children containing fables and moral lessons. We're spending less time in the classroom on the Bible, which should be the principal text yes. in our schools. Yes. The Bible states these great moral lessons better than any man-made book. Woo. So we're hoping that the schools would at least get back to teaching just math, science, arithmetic, right, and English and whatever. And I'm thinking, well, if they don't get back to that, then we just need to go full force and say, look, we're going to go back to the Founding Fathers. We're going to remind you what Dr. Benjamin Rush said, that the purpose of the public schools is to train up your child or children to love and serve God. Train up your children to love and serve their country, not hate your country, That's but to right. love your country, and train up your child to love and serve their family. Wow. That's huge. Big deal. So Jefferson is really the quote unquote mistaken author. One in one letter I read, Jefferson was there was a biographer that wanted to write about Jefferson. The biographer got it wrong and Jefferson had to correct him. He said, You realize that when they were signing the Constitution and writing it, he says, I wasn't even in the country. But they're attributing me to this state, this clause. He said I was in Europe when the Constitution was planned and never saw it until after it had been established. So here you have this court taking something, not in the Constitution, and not in the Declaration of Independence, a letter <laughs> written in response to a grave concern from a religious group, taking it out of context, not even reading the whole letter, as they had done in previous precedential, is that a good word, precedential? Previous decisions that were had come before, oh. the courts had done that before, and now all of a sudden it just gets twisted. And where's where's the yelling and screaming about it? Where's the checks and balances? Uh, so look look at some of these quotes. These are great quotes. President George Washington, you guys know him, right? Oh, yeah. yeah. Founding uh, father, father of our country, right? He said this. He believed that schools and educations were to be the proper places to encourage the religion, morality, and knowledge so necessary to good government and the happiness of mankind. He's got this other quote that says, religion and morality are indispensable supports to our government. If you take away those religion and morality supports, your government will go down the tubes. There's no separation of church and state. It was never intended that way. Noah Webster, he's, he's called the schoolmaster to America. He said, education is useless without the Bible. Huh, interesting. But our Supreme Court decided, well, we don't need the Bible anymore. We don't need prayer anymore. We don't need the Ten Commandments. We're going to read one about that. You're going to, you're going to, it's going to make a hair stand up when we read one of these other cases. Education is useless without the Bible. Our continued freedom and success is dependent on our educating the youth of America in the principles of Christianity, he said. All the miseries and evils, he went on to say, which men suffer from vice, crime, ambition, injustice, oppression, slavery, and war proceed from their despising or neglecting the precepts contained in the Bible. That makes sense. The Bible. Yeah. What do you have going on today? No God. You have an absolute war against God. An absolute war against Christianity right now. We are sitting in the midst of a cultural civil war right now. Yeah. And we've got to keep fighting the good fight. We cannot stop. 
Uh, here's Dr. Benjamin Ruff. I already alluded to him. Three purposes, as we said, of a public school. We already said it. Teach the children to love and serve God, love and serve their country, love and serve their family. Now, when I first read this, I was a little bit confused because I always said God, family, country. But he said, and I, I caught it after a few times I read it a few years ago, he says God, country, family. And I thought, why does he say that? So I kept on reading. He said, if we lose control of our country, our country will become, get it, the great enemy of our family. That's right. Has that not come true? Oh, yeah. That's wow. right. So that's why. It wasn't downplaying family. It was putting it in order. Because we can't lose our country or we'll end up losing our family. A uh, great book I, we read not too long ago. We were teaching it on Wednesday nights. Um, when a nation forgets God, the seven lessons to learn from Nazi Germany. Written ten years ago. You would have thought he wrote it last week. It's so uh, alive to what's going on right now. In the same playbook that Hitler and uh, Goebbels and, the, you know, he was the minister of propaganda, right? When you have a, a you thought czars were bad, right? Here you have a minister of propaganda. When that comes up on the board, you should have a red flag go up real quick. He's there to, to lie to everybody. But well, we already have that today. We have fake news. You're getting put thrown in Facebook jail. This post could get taken down. I mean, it's all kinds of things. Where's free speech in that? How do you suspend President Trump for over, what, a year now? They're not going to let him go on, on uh, Twitter now until 2022? Where's the free speech? They added two more years to that. Two more years? Yeah. Who? who? Omnipotent God or omnipotent Twitter. big tech? Yes. That's another sermon, right? Because well. we already did omnipotent God <laughs> or omnipotent oh, government. Man. See, who's all powerful? These guys think they are, right? They think they're God. That's right. Oh, yeah. You already know that. You've done your vaccine checks. You've done all those things. Yeah. You know who's trying to change your DNA. You know those things. You know who's doing it. He's, qu he's quoted as saying it. Yeah. So, where are we at here? Well, Benjamin Rush. Oh, he wrote a, in uh, 1791, he wrote a, an educational policy paper, and he said this. In contemplating the political institutions of the United States, if, he said, look what he says, if we remove the Bible from schools, I lament that we waste so much time and money in punishing crimes and take so little pains to prevent them. He had a quote one, maybe one of you guys know, how much it cost, uh, how much a school, uh, it costs a school to try to educate a child now in the public school system. It's like hundreds of thousands of dollars. We have school systems that have, have get millions and millions of dollars, and yet, for instance, the city of Baltimore, all their high schools, they don't have a boy or a girl proficient in English, I mean in math or science, in all the high schools. And yet they get the majority, they they're like the top five money getters for education. Where's the money going? Wow. It's just absolutely crazy. So, our found, founding fathers, this is back to page four, our founding fathers believe that our American government, by the way, it's a republic, not a democracy. Look it up. Push back against it. We are not a true democracy. We are a constitutional republic. Would not function properly if we separated. Founding fathers believe we would not function properly, think about it now, if we were to separate it from religious principles. Ding, 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 ding. Hey, absolutely right. Our government has not functioned properly for a long time. That's correct. John Adams said this, We have no government armed with power, capable, capable of contending with human passions, unbridled, by morality and religion. He said, we have a banner hanging up on one of the windows at, at church. Our constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. So what's that say to us? Well, obviously, if I go and I elect somebody who is immoral 
and irreligious, guess what? They're not going to obey the Constitution. Anybody in Congress today not obeying the Constitution? Yeah. Anybody trying to shred the Constitution? Yeah. Yes. Why? Well, do they love God, love their country, and love their... They might love their family, but the first two are for sure, right? Absolutely not. It's just so amazing to see all of these warnings. And yet, here we are where we are today. Uh, Alexis de Tocqueville... He wrote a book, actually it was entitled originally The Republic in America. I have it one of the, I saw that in the original copy. But, he, but they changed it to Democracy in America. He said, there is no country, this is a Frenchman, you may know the story of, of Alexis? Traveled across the United States, uh, 1800s, uh, did a study of course, saw the French Revolution, how it was a revolution without God, right? and how we saw our revolution as a revolution with God, and his revolution led to the guillotine, and our revolution led to what? The greatest country ever in the history of the United States. Of, of, of our land, right? Forever. Ever. ever. Ever and ever. Here's what he said. There he said this. There is no country in the whole world in which the Christian religion retains a greater influence over the souls of men then in America, and there can be no greater proof of its utility and of its conformity to human nature than that its influence is most powerfully felt over the most enlightened and free nation of the earth. Is that powerful? So it's, every once in a while I should listen to a Frenchman. And he's right, isn't he? Absolutely. Harry S. Truman. In this country of ours, it has been demonstrated the fundamental unity of Christianity and democracy. Now here's some of the, number four there, some of the detrimental principles or effects of this deception. So what happens? So what has happened because of this separation of church and state? Well, here's a couple examples. There are so many of them, but these two in particular just scream out. Uh, 1963. Abington versus Shem. Shem. This court case reversed two centuries of precedent, ordering the Bible and its teaching no, to be no longer permitted in public schools. 1963. That's bad. Here's a quote. This is what, this is what those who voted court for this said. The court said this, if portions of the New Testament were read without explanation, they could be and had been psychologically harmful to the students. Yeah, yeah love your neighbor. Oh, I don't know what that really means. Whoa. This is the craziness. These are the educated people that are put into power. I know pastors who were opposing, who would oppose putting the Bible back into the schools. Because they said, well, who would teach them? You sound like this 1963 court case. How about if you just read it for what it says? And if you don't get it, go home and ask your parents. And if they don't get it, go ask your pastor. Or give me a call. I mean, really, right? I'd be happy to answer your phone call. But do you see what they said? Is that not what's... This is going on right now, too. 1980. Ronald Reagan was coming into power. I'm in power, sorry about that. Coming into office, right? I guess it's kind of power. Same right? deal. Yeah. And, but when he got into, into office, there was a liberal uh, Supreme Court. Five for sure, because this case tells us this. 1980. And then, of course, he, you know who he put on the Supreme Court? Sandra Day O'Connor, right? First woman. You don't hear about that anymore, do you? Why isn't that all talked about? And, um, and then he had to, um, I think, replace Rehnquist. And I think um, Scalia came in, I think, for Rehnquist, if I'm not mistaken. So he had a couple good uh, choices come up. But in 1980, I don't remember, do you remember this? You told me you remembered it, Lester, didn't you? You said this case. 1980, I was just a baby, but you might remember. Stone Whoa. versus Graham. Whoa. I couldn't help it. 
Stone versus Graham, 5-4 decision. They ruled that it was unconstitutional for a student to see a copy of the Ten Commandments on the wall. Just to see it. Here's what they said, I'm quoting. If the posted copies of the Ten Commandments are to have any effect at all, it will be to induce the school children to read, meditate upon, perhaps to venerate and obey the Ten Commandments. This is not a permissible objective, they said. Oh, Lord. <clears throat> Thou shalt not steal? Yeah, I don't know. Johnny, you know, think about it. If you want it, take it. It's yours. Go ahead and steal, Johnny. It's okay. No. But don't we have that going on today? Right. We're not trying cases where people are stealing things. They're allowed to go in. I mean, this is, this is totally unbelievable. Well, that's what insurance is for. Yeah. <laughs> so, what happens? Well, because of these, this bizarre logic, as David Barton's words, bizarre logic, there's been this societal transformation. You guys all know this, right? Following the 1962-63 court-ordered removal of religious principles from students, guess what? Teenage, you can look this one up, teenage pregnancy immediately soared over 700%. With the U.S. recording the highest teen pregnancy in the industrial world. Wow. At that point. And it's just been a continued slow for some. In uh, another one of his books, he has a complete chart. You can go online and, and find the stuff. Uh, drug addiction and, and, and uh, you know, uh, everything divorce. from. What's that? Divorce. Yeah, divorce. I mean, every, just rates. Oh, wow. Everything going up and down. I mean, it's horrible. And of course, then, what's that lead to? We got the 63 decision. That, that goes on to the 73 decision, right? Totally unconstitutional. The courts totally overstepped their boundary with Roe v. Wade. It's not in the Constitution. If anything, we should say, what is it? Inalienable rights or what? Life, yeah. liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So if anything, banning abortion is supported by the Constitution and Declaration not enforcing or allowing it. That's right. So if it's on the Constitution, it goes back to the states. What are the states doing now? Well, the states are standing up for their Tenth Amendment rights. And many are, are, are filing, filing legislation. And some states that are, that are more liberal, they're going to want to approve it. So hey, they can do it. I don't agree with it, but they can do it. It's a free country. But you can't enforce things upon others. That's what the problem is. So, any questions or comments so far? Let's see if anybody's putting any comments online there. Hey, Denise. Do you guys like when I call your name out when you're watching, or is it embarrassing? Yeah, everyone. Embarrasses you? No. <laughs> Leslie, Linda, Denise, who else is on there? A bunch of others. Did the sound pick up? I don't know, but I can't. There's more names that they think you just scroll. Does it scroll itself up? Yeah. Can't can't scroll down, right? Oh yeah, you can't look at that. Lynn is also <laughs> on. Alicia says we apologize for Good. technical difficulties. So yeah, thanks. Honey. Right now, in there. So no questions, no comments. So this makes sense. So I, I try to write everything out, especially for Patriot Church. So that you can take these quotes, and I got page numbers and where I got them and everything. And if I miss one, you can just tell me. I'll, I'll, I'll get it to you. But you can you can take this. I mean, you can take this thing to the school board. They give you three minutes to read. You can just say, "Hey, read it. Just read the thing." I mean, whatever, right? So um, that's a big deal. <clears throat> so lastly, here's just a great conclusion. I couldn't say it any better than David Barton did. So I'm gonna read to you. <clears throat> Excuse me. In conclusion. Historically speaking, in regard to separation of church and state, it was never intended to become a tool to secularize the public square. Right? Isn't that what's happened? We've removed nativity scenes, we've taken down the Star of David, I mean, we've done all this stuff. We've completely whitewashed our, our public squares and everything else, right? And it says, to the contrary, the founding fathers intended that biblical principles 
be part of public society and believed that the separation doctrine would preserve those principles in the public arena rather than prohibit them. So the separation that Jefferson wrote about was to keep government out of the church, not church out of the public square or government. Yeah. Because when you see quotes like John Adams, our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people, how do you come to the conclusion that they're anti-God, anti-religion? They're not. It doesn't make any sense. And statistically speaking, the inclusion of biblical principles and values in societal program, programs produces positive, measurable results. Therefore, citizens, that's you and me, right? We should not be intimidated from utilizing those principles or values, right? Fight the good fight. Stand in the truth, right? We've got to keep on doing that. Engage. Engage is a big one. Get involved. Pick a lane and get in that thing and be like a bulldog and don't let go. Right? Like old William Wilberforce in Amazing wow. Grace or John Quincy Adams when he, when he was done being president, he went back to Congress because he wanted to abolish slavery. And they tried to squash his words every time he came to the floor to speak. But what president do you know would come back to Congress? I hear another one's trying to come back. That's interesting. It's definitely going to be Grover Cleveland, though, I think. Quote me on that one, right? He's going to be the second group of Cleveland. Two terms, not in a row. All right. So, therefore, citizens should not be intimidated from utilizing those principles or values, not only because they were constitutionally, get this, constitutionally protected and are now being slowly reaffirmed by the courts. There are some courts, right? They're staying, right now we have a pretty, pretty good court right now, Supreme Court. If they read the Constitution, we've yeah. got some things that have been passed oh, that, they, that, that they have, um, you know, voted on. Um, but, you know, some of them are kind of wishy-washy, though. Yeah. But we can't rely on, on the judicial branch to fix this, right? We, I told them this one, we got to, it's MAGO 2.0. Make America godly again, okay? Yeah. And then we said this morning, we were talking about holiness too. We said, Maha, make America holy again. Right, all right. right. Anything wrong with that? All right. So, what's the last words here? Well, especially these principles work. He said, America will be morally and culturally strong only to the degree that biblical, religious, and moral principles are incorporated throughout society and its institutions. So, take courage, stand up for what has been proven to be successful. Amen? Amen. Wow. That's a big deal. So, don't buy the lies. As old uh, George Mason said, well, we have to have a fundamental, we have to have a frequent recurrence to fundamental principles. Right? We've got to study our Constitution, right? So that we will know our rights and that we will know when they are being infringed upon. If you don't know what your rights are, you won't know when they're stepping on your rights. That's right. So that's powerful. Any other thoughts? Any questions? So uh, can we announce anything about that thing yet, or is that is that going to go through, Miss Joanne? Oh. oh. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yes. When, which place? Yes. When? So, this is what I'm, but I haven't talked to the producer of him yet. So, yes. here's what's coming down the pipe. We're looking at June 26th, the uh, Frontline Doctors oh. are coming out with a docu have come out with a documentary. It's called uh, 2020, That's Seeing 2020. 2020. And I thought, man, that is, that's, we talked all 2020, our, our sermon series was 2020 Perfect Vision. That was our sermon series the whole 2020 year. And they're saying they couldn't find a church that would allow this documentary to be seen. Really? Yeah, so I got an email, because it came from you, sort of, to, to you, and then to uh, Dr. Um, so, well, what, can we mention her? Dr. Jana. Yeah, Dr. Jana. Sure. So she's up here. And we're going to show that June 26th. Oh. And they're expecting, they want a minimum of 200 people are going to show up. We're going to pack the church out. And then we're going to try to show it again further south. And then I'm going to find somebody up this way who is really going to stand in the truth. And we're going to 
show it again. So I'm, I'm shooting for three, three presentations. So yeah. So I mean, you can't help it if, if that's the name of their documentary. See in 2020, and we proclaim 2020 perfect vision all year. How about it? Yeah. They were made to go together. So that's the first uh, announcement. Uh, yeah. Second one, fourth Sunday, Sebastian location, uh, Patriot Church, fourth Sunday. Uh, of June, and then of course July, 4th of July, obviously we're going to have to probably talk a little bit about patriotism on the 4th of July. And then we got another 4th Sunday in, in uh, July as well, so lots of things happening. If you don't, and we don't have your email or your phone numbers, make sure we get it before you go. And you guys online, you've been emailing me and stuff as well. And I saw your hand. Yeah, it's the 26th, that That's a Saturday. Saturday. Yeah, so I think after, they didn't have time to set up, I don't think, yet. No. Afternoon, evening, something like that. Yeah, you don't have to come. Yeah, so I'm waiting to see the trailer. They're going to email me the trailer. I'm going to talk with the producer, and we're going to incorporate that, and uh, it's going to be wonderful. Have you seen the trailer yet? Yes, I've seen the film. And I oh, the film, too? Thank you. I want to thank you so much for your courage to stand for the truth. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. God yeah, bless. be courageous. That's why I wore my uh, my shirt today was the, this one here, right? Yeah, your first mistake was thinking I was what? One of the sheep, right? Yeah. So, uh, now, we had a sermon not too long ago, right? The sheep don't stay lost, amen? They don't stay lost, you know, uh, and they know their shepherd's voice. They must. That's right. That. So some people think I'm just a sheep and I just keep on going astray. Well, you don't, you don't stay lost when the shepherd's looking for you. They and hear his voice. What's that? They follow their shepherd. They follow their shepherd, yeah. Well, so you got, you got two choices. <laughs> love God or don't love God, one or the other. So, yeah. Amen. All right, hey, thanks to all you guys listening. I hope you can listen. Some say you can't hear. I'm so sorry. We've had trouble since Tuesday. John says it's a it's a spiritual warfare attack battle, but but a battle, and he's got his camera tonight too, which That's he used right. to always do. So no he's going to post that on no YouTube. So we're going to blow it up. And then my and my tech Facebook guy, he doesn't too. know it yet. He's my Facebook tech guy. Too. He's moving back from Montana, and he's coming to Florida. He should be here in a few days, any day. And uh, so we're going to try to get everything on the website, so you can just go there. You know. The professionals do it. They click on the little Heavy. thing on the website, Heavy. and everything works perfectly, right? Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. So anyway, all right. Well, let me pray for you guys. I'm so glad to see you all tonight. It's a great and all you newbies on meeting. So yes, ma'am, another. Typical school teachers, you got to take attendance, yep, yep, give you yep. credit. Yep. If you weren't here, you got to bring a note next time <laughs> why you missed. <laughs> and, <laughs> oh. Yeah. All right. Yeah, we can do that too. So we'll see. You know, because until they chip you, we can we can scan you after you let them chip you, right? Good We're not letting Lord. them chip us, are we? No. So no. Please don't do that. Yeah. Fight that to the end. All right. If you have an issue about that and you're not sure, read about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Okay. I'll tell you how to how to die gracefully and in the power of Almighty God, won't you? Yeah, so. uh, Lord Jesus, thank you for this group tonight here up in Melbourne. Thank you for those watching tonight. Lord, thank you for your truth. Thank you for in, empowering us to be courageous, to stand firm, to stand fast in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And you go on to tell us, Paul says, and do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. We are not going to be bound again. No tyrannical government, no tyrannical big tech, no tyrannical medical industry is going to tell us what we have to do. Jeez. We have God-given rights from the, I'm saying, from the moment of conception, and we'll, we'll say that for sure, but I know from the moment of birth, we have God-given rights, rights of life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness and we stand on the law of our land our u.s constitution and we and we look at and believe the heartbeat of our declaration of independence so lord just continue to uh, to protect us we pray yeah. keep us safe as we continue to to fight the good fight speaking truth at the intersection of church and state we love you jesus in your name we pray amen Oh. All right, bless you guys. Bless you guys.